You know, I'm, I'm so deeply touched that God would redeem me and then give mom and me. You kids. I paint the picture, the narrative in my heart of my most fond moments in life not being the great ministry that God has granted to me. Jim, the leader, who's, who's got these accolades and the degrees. It's, it's the times when we were in the living room on the floor tickling the life out of each other. Profound moments of giggle mm. and, and, the, and these times of uh, meals around the table sharing how is the day going what did you learn in school today and giggling as you would tell these stories mm. <laughs> at stuff at school and i i think those were the moments when mom and me would look in and just say lord it works thank you jesus hello and welcome to the naked gospel where we have conversations about sex singleness marriage pornography and everything in between we bring on cultural thinkers parents important folk and normal folk alike i am your host shane o'neill if you're listening in video versions of all of these episodes are available at youtube uh, proven ministries we have that below if you're watching you just rather listen in then all of these episodes are available on every major podcast platform whether you're listening or watching do subscribe and continue to track with us. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy the episode. So guys and gals, I spent a lot of time on this podcast encouraging all of you to have these sorts of conversations in your communities, with your churches, with your family members. Uh, so today, I get a unique opportunity to be able to showcase that for you. Um, a man is joining me today. Uh, he was 13 years on the mission field, uh, four kids. Um, started the missions department at Liberty University. Uh, led two major mission organizations, ABWE and Crossworld. Was the interim president for a major Christian university. And today works for mobilization and missions for Frontier Ventures. Uh, all of that is to say this man is my father and uh, I'm looking forward to hanging out with him, uh, primarily because um, I care about how my father is doing. Uh, whenever I talk to him on the phone, it's not uncommon for me to ask how is his intimacy with my mom? Because it matters and I care. Um, he doesn't ever have to answer, but I want to be a good son. I want to be a good brother to him. And so those sorts of conversations are important. He's been absolutely supportive with this podcast. And so we're just going to sit down together and showcase in real time, unscripted, what it looks like to have a conversation about pains and defeats and forgiveness and Jesus and family. Uh, so thank you for being with us. And uh, yeah, if you... Find this podcast beneficial, share it with someone you think would likewise benefit from it. And would love to hear your comments below. So do like, subscribe, and comment, and continue to track with us. Dad, thanks for being here. Yeah, great to see you, Shane. How are Wonderful you? to be here. I am a fan from a distance. Watch your podcasts. Very much appreciate what you're trying to do and say. And uh, what a treat to sit side by side with you for a few minutes and, and chat. If I could also say, I, you bring up a, a fresh language when you describe me as your son. You also say, "Father, uh, you're you're the son mm. to dad." You also say he's my brother, mm. and I think that's very healthy. Mm. And the way of Jesus, there's the father son dimension, but mm. then there's the very mutual mm. brother to brother, and I, it's just healthy. I appreciate it. Yeah. It's still startlesome to me that Jesus, uh, right there when he says, no longer do I call you servants, right there in John, was it John 14 maybe? Where he says, no longer do I call you servants because servants don't know what their master is doing. Uh, but I've told you everything. And so I call you friends. You're my friends. So practicing friendship with God uh, is one of my favorite aspects of my relationship with him. But likewise, learning to practice friendship with you mm. has been a neat. And I would... I would say probably from middle school, I'd use language about you that you were my best friend. Is that not mm. true? Yeah, very. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I dig e all of that. Even while you really struggled with Jesus, yeah. it became noticeable to mom and me, age 12. Mm. Uh, you also <laughs> allowed me in. Mm. And so we had 
from those first days, I'm, I was stunned by the kinds of things we would talk about. Mm. Very thankful for that. And then you, you aged and matured. Uh, kind of went, you had to go dip your toes in hell. Fortunately, back and Jesus redeems you. And then from that time on, the conversations just have gone deep and rich and wide. And, mm. and I appreciate it too. I think my generation, we're still a little bit more reserved even though I was at the uh, at the front end of the sexual revolution, yeah, I've just what I love about your generation and you is, dang, you guys, you, it's raw. You get yeah. it out there and you use a fresh language, but still with respect. Mm -hmm. And I do appreciate that. And I think my generation needs your voices. Mm -hmm. You've heard enough of critique about y'all mm -hmm. from my kind. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to say too, there are some wonderful things you all are doing and. And I know mom and I both just really appreciate that sense of authentic, transparent rawness with respect, you know, so it's a joy. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I've noticed that, too. Um, well, first off, I love you. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Um, uh, I've noticed that similar dynamic, and we've talked about it a, a bit before, about kind of the older generation tries to power play the younger generation because they don't know what to do with them. And the younger generation is so individualized, and we hate being power played, and so we then completely disregard the older generation. And there's real estrangement there <laughs> because both generations are just, you know, literally working with their insecurities and it's kind of the the two magnetic ends pushing away from each other like as hard as you try and push them together they're going to repel each other in the same measure and i do see that so i found the uh the brother language to be helpful because it will seem like kind of the older generation will try as i said in power play um and try and take this position of mother or father and it's like well i've got i've got a heck of a dad and a heck of a mom i don't need a mom or a dad but uh, if you want to be an older brother, an older sister to me, then that seems to be a place that we've been able to sit in. Um, all of a sudden, they receive me better. They don't try and power play me because they're learning to see me as family. I'm practicing family with them. Um, have you seen a similar dynamic? I'd be interested in your thoughts. <laughs> Mom and I spend a lot of our time with our peers, our counterparts in our age range. Um, <laughs> not... They almost view you as an unreached people group. Yeah. They're so intimidated by the dynamics yeah. and your point on power. So the, 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 the response is to do what you know to do. Your default setting is to control. Yeah. And then trying to, I think we've tried probably for 20 years now, recognizing how you framed it in this next gen space that you have been joining us in for these many years is to create the place for mutuality to take place. So what kind of language helps that, you know, in this process? And, and I think the, the brother-sister language is crucial. If I could commend you on behalf of the, our peers, my age, what they love about you is how you respect them and you honor them. Mm -hmm. That helps in this exchange. But nonetheless, it is. And, and you have creatively, if I could commend you again, uh, created a language where you've said to them, we need mothers and fathers. And you're, you're reframing the discipleship language to a familial language, which is huge, you know, in the conversational piece. So I know we have, and, and you all wouldn't know this, but Shane and I talk about this quite a bit. And it's, it's just exciting when I encourage Shane, Shane, I want you to go spend time with that brother or with that sister, and then he does. And, and there's that honoring that takes place. And so <clears throat> you're actually helping to disciple up mm. in the language that you use. Mom and I are trying to help to disciple by creating the patterns of mutuality mm. that can take place so that, that, that language and relationship can take place. And then lo and behold, you know what happens. <laughs> when folks, when they get there, they come away saying, this is lovely. Mm. This is the stuff of Jesus, mm. right? And and it, then we just back out. Jim and Sterling reseed, and this movement and this conversation of mutuality, generational divides are are now are now being negotiated, mm. and it it increases. 
Mm. So it's a beautiful thing. I think we're on a bit of a crusade mm. to help the body of Christ change the discipleship language because it can it can connote too much power. Mm. But the familial language um, is, I find, very inviting. Yeah. And, and disarming. Yeah. And it seems to be Paul's paradigm as well. Yeah. Right, he literally frames the entirety of a book around church and uses exclusively familial language to express what that church is supposed to be structured as. Um, First Timothy, um, uh, yeah, we do. We have an a- allergy to uh, an allergic reaction to mentor discipleship language. I do, um, which is so. It's so funny. I'm, I'm willing to let somebody be present in my life if they're kind of an older brother, or older sister. Um, but if they're not willing to be that and they only want to be their, my mentor or my discipler, then all of a sudden I want very little to do with them. It uh, seems disingenuous and I don't want to let them into my life if they're not going to let me into their life. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we should get to the topic at hand. <laughs> what a delightful divergence. Yes, thanks, yes. thanks for letting us yeah, thanks migrate for the down that affirmation. Thought. I really appreciate it, Dad. Uh-huh. You're, you're, uh, yeah, I, I can't imagine life without you. Oh, so, mutual, I yeah. Add. Um, Dad, I want to. Where do I want to start? So, you, know, you could start with your personal stuff. You already mentioned the sexual revolution. Um, per the internet, I mean, really kind of had a uh, a real foothold maybe in the '90s, but even then it was dial up until the very end of the '90s, early 2000s. Um, so I don't know what you know pornography was like necessarily amongst your peers growing up. It was the sexual revolution, so there's free sex, free love, probably just a lot more, um, well, casual, intimate, intimacy-less sex um, without a, you know necessarily affection. So I, I, I paint the picture for us. What was your childhood like there? I uh, would love to get a window seat. I'm, I'm. Let me frame it from 1968. I'm minding my own business. I'm 12 years old, living in the projects of Reading, Pennsylvania. In those days, we called it the projects, not the hood. Mm. And something was happening. There was a cultural s- transformation taking place in our society. The nearest thing I could describe it as was dads became absentee. And all of a sudden, dads were gone. I didn't know what. My brother's friends were coming back from the Vietnam War. And I remember hanging out in the back as a little guy watching my brother chat with all of his buds. And they had changed mm. in the attitudes and the dispositions. And then the, and the casualty of the marijuana that started to just seep into this environment. And all of a sudden, teen pregnancies in my neighborhoods, mm. hanging all over the place and watching their disposition and this this casual language on sex. I'm a good Catholic boy growing up. Mom and dad just trying to slug it out, do good things to help to help their kids t- to grow uh, in faith in the religious tradition. And it was it was a radical shift. And I didn't I'm 12. And then and then comes the and, and my friends. I had a, I had enough awareness. Uh, one of my friends as a 15 year old got to go to Woodstock. And that then they came back and it was like this. It was this this glorious picture of what they called free love, Mm -hmm. which was just (laughs) sex with some pretty significant rock and roll (laughs) attached to it. Yeah. And that was invading us. And so those were the streams coming at me. And I didn't I had no language for this. I wasn't prepared. My my poor parents weren't prepared for it. And, And so you move in and through my high school years, the. The, the, the whispers started to grow louder and louder toward sex and the the porn magazines they didn't infiltrate my world too much but they were out there and that started to get talked about more and more yeah Playboy started to have its powerful rise at that point yeah yeah and again these were streams taking place that what do you do with this for myself, I'm, I'm now coming into that place of puberty in my own life, and I'm watching all of this, and then the sexual revolution hits. And between drugs and sex, into my university years of study, you know, <clears throat> once you gutted out God, uh, I, I, had, I, was, I was losing reasons to say no right. in, the, in this process. So by and by, you don't. And you get, I get swept up into it. And I saw my friends get swept up into it. 
And, you know, tragically, probably not unlike your experience, a bunch of my friends died radical drug-related deaths. Senior year, first year out in the university studies. And I'm watching all this, and it was just deeply disorienting somewhere in my heart. While I'm, my, my friends described it as the world is coming to one big party. I, I would just, I kept asking, but what about the next day? Yeah. You know, when you feel so bad. So this, this revolution was coming and it was hitting hard. It was hitting my friends. It was hitting me. It was, uh, it was destroying relationships because how of how I was treating girls in this process. You treat them as objects. And it, part of that was just feeding my flesh or just the culture. Um, nobody was talking about generous, gracious, kind living in the way of Jesus in those days. And so you, everybody was treating each other with selfish ambition. That was, that was the governing pattern on, until Jesus invaded my world. So it, it, I, I can see now... Uh, the exponential growth of the movements and to where now you literally need to have an entire movement like yours devoted to the sexual revolution because I saw it pick up steam in the 60s. Now, for sure, there were antecedents, 50s and 40s in our culture. It was percolating. And then the institutions and the trusts that we had, uh, they were gutted. And so there was less and less reason to stand for some measure of God, truth, family once they get gutted and then once our culture permitted i'm sitting there watching shane more and more sexually oriented suggestive programming and once that door was opened up it was there was no turning back and so that was the that was the backstory and i, I got swept up into it hurt people was hurt by people and then it just really finally hit me especially the world isn't coming to one big party <laughs> we're really damaging one another pretty big time mm. john lennon's uh, imagine mm. that's such a powerful song um uh, but then i listen to it and it's uh it's kind of just the, the it really is the humanist ideal it's kind of commu it's half communism half woodstock you yeah. bring it together he wrote that song and uh, and I don't think we've ever really recovered. I think literally what you just painted out is the landscape that most of us still find ourselves living in, just with more advanced technology. <laughs> you know, yeah. There's um, <clears throat> I had this story recently about a uh, a youth pastor. He was talking to a group of uh, youth. Um, it's a high school, and <laughs> just guys and. Very quickly, the guys started talking about the young men. They started talking about the uh, the number of women they're sleeping with currently. And the youth pastor's hearing this, and he starts to become a little bit frantic, starts to want to just tell them, like, no, this is not God's word. This is bad. This is wrong. What are you doing? Uh, he bites his tongue, and he listens. He listens. And they continue mm -hmm. to talk, and then one, one guy shares. Um, he shares that... Uh, there was this girl he really liked. He's sleeping with multiple women. There's this one girl he really liked, and he got to sleep with her recently. But then he said that afterwards, he felt nothing. He didn't like her anymore. He didn't feel anything. It was just empty. He spilled his passion, and all of a sudden, it was gone. And uh, the youth, youth pastor hears that. And at that point, he steps in. He says, uh, I'm going to paint two pictures for you. One is the paint picture that you just painted yourselves like would you rather continue to live your lives being able to sleep with whoever you want whenever you want or would you be rather 50 years from now when you or your spouse is dying when your spouse is dying when she's dying she looks at you and she says for the last 50 years you've been faithful to me i'm thankful it was you thank you for being with me Right. And this deep sense of gratitude and fullness and knowing that you were, were loyal and faithful and present to another human being who knew all of your all of your baggage, all of your worst fears. And you knew theirs and you still stayed faithful. To one another. But she shares that. And uh, and all the boys are just silent. <laughs> and they're like, with I kind of just without reservation, they say after after a really big pause, the second one, we want that second one. 
And what he did was paint a positive vision. Mm-hmm. Cause even like even in antiquity, there's there was a one of David's David's sons who raped his sister. Yeah, and <clears throat> he was so infatuated with her. I, I hate this story because I've experienced this story. Not that I've ever raped anybody, but I've experienced this with porn. But he um, he rapes his sister, and then and then it says afterwards that uh, he didn't feel anything towards her. He despised her. It says he despised her. Yeah. Right? He like spilled his lust. And it wasn't really love because he wasn't willing to wait. You know, there was no real affection of commitment there. So even as you describe that, all that goes through my mind. Like I, I think we're in the exact same spot. Mm. And a dad who doesn't know what to do, mm. so he goes mum. Yeah. A brother living in anger, yeah, to seek the retaliation. Yeah, and a sister, a daughter, who's just ruined. And the narrative of her life, the trajectory now is going to have to be. I have to spend the rest of my life rebuilding. You know what? When I when I look back, I you know I'm I'm so deeply touched that God would redeem me and then give mom and me. You kids, I paint the picture, the narrative in my heart of my most fond moments in life, not being the great ministry that God has granted to me. Jim, the leader, who's, who's got these accolades and the degrees. It's, it's the times when we were in the living room on the floor, tickling the life out of each other. Profound moments of giggle. Mm. And, and, the, and these times of uh, meals around the table sharing how is the day going what did you learn in school today and giggling as you would tell these stories mm. <laughs> at stuff at school and i i think those were the moments when mom and me would look in and just say lord it works thank you jesus he redeemed me he's just pulling me back from the abyss myself because i was with my friends just about to fall off the cliff sometimes you get to the edge you don't know what to do thankfully jesus he was quick to rescue me in the midst of all of this chaos that was taking place. And, you know, it's been a battle. You know, I, I think uh, when when you kids were being born and growing up in the Philippines, um, mom and I decided to at least quarterly, and we had friends to help, Aunt, Uncle Glenn and Aunt Sandy, some of our colleagues, some of the helpers could watch you kids while mom and I would go over to the next island for a day and a half just to enjoy one another and that that those sorts of rhythms were the the kinds of things we had to create to keep the intimacy fresh in our lives so each family each couple has got to create the rhythms Mm. that are necessary and one of the greatest challenges i think for the romance of a couple for the sex of the husband and the wife is when the kids come you kids are a game changer you know and and i think that so when i look in and, and I think of what the story could have been like. And I see a lot of my friends when I go back. I'm stunned now to hear the stories of my high school buds in, div- in divorce and the kids and the broken families. Even good religious schools that we went to and my, my parents were conscientious of. It, it tells a story. You know, and, and there but for the grace of God, that's my story. Yeah. And God sends mom into my life and me into her life and then you into our lives you know on this head so you, you when you when you tell the, the story and and you see absalom move in to 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 murder his brother out of deep, deep anger and retribution and then the sister and you you think of our day and god thank you you know so my, my, isn't it fascinating, son? How do you put it on the trophies on the wall or in the plaques? Mm. My, my greatest joy, <laughs> my greatest moments are mom and me with you kids having the giggle of our lives and then watching you just tickle the grandkids, mm. Shauna's kids and Kelly's kids, your siblings like you do. Those are the powerful moments when you say, Jesus, this thing works and is very, very beautiful. Uh, but it comes at the point of making those crucial decisions. Mm. That, that's I think it's part of what you're all about, uh, proven ministries, and that I I just look in and, and say you are you are graciously prodding 
the people of God into those crucial decisions that 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 spirit of accountability that you create. Uh, I, I I just love how you guys wrestle with transformation, and then the product of that is the giggles, mm. the moments on the floor, the kids are there. It's that Thursday night, Friday night, popcorn movie night, pizza, and the giggles. And I think that's Jesus is looking in and saying, "This is my family. <laughs> These are my kids. Mm. I'm loving this." But it's hard work to get there because the field's been littered. And uh, we here in America now are even struggling with, do we even like marriage? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I have been uh, officially dubbed by the twin nephews as the tickle monster. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I think it's important that, I, and it is, in a, a large way, what we're all about because I, it's people's look at uh, sexual sin in such isolation because we do it in isolation. Like just because we do it in a dark room where no one can see, doesn't mean it. In it, it doesn't impact us in our relationships elsewhere outside of that room. And have sat with so many fathers who don't know how to be present to their children because they feel fake. They don't tickle them. They don't play with them because they've conditioned their bodies to do other things. Not that they would ever abuse their children, but they just feel so much shame because there's association about what they've done in dark places for years. And a lot of people think that the sexual sin goes away once you get married or that there's no sexual integrity practiced in marriage and it's just BS. Uh, so thank you for playing that out. And you're absolutely right. It, uh, that is the, the heart of what we're, what we're doing because it's a, it's a fuller humanity. It's a, it's a real humanity. When I look at the depression, suicide rates, and anxiety of <clears throat> our current generation um, and how it's on an all-time record high, it, it at the very least, it tells us that we, we don't know how to live in this life, right? Mm. That we're deeply dissatisfied and something is terribly wrong. We don't know how to live here. Um, uh, two, yeah. two brief thoughts. Uh, one, mom and I are on a crusade. We're out and about a lot. Our ministry is very itinerant hotels or wherever we are whenever we see a family even if they're struggling we'll we'll very often just swing by on the way out and say you you have a beautiful family you have mm. a lot to be thankful for mm. and even this morning before coming over here there was a dad and a beautiful little door at the hotel and these waitresses were chatting with the father and and the little girl in this food exchange and i just swung by and i just said you have a lovely daughter mm. He was he, in, in, in an instant, he stops and looks. Thank you. Mm. It was beautiful. So to affirm the good, look for the good, celebrate it in this process. And, and then there's another piece. And I've had a hard time with this uh, at, a, at an accountability level because it's hard in ministry. When we lived here in Lynchburg and I was leading the grad missiology programs, undergrad at Liberty. I found three other pastors, and we met twice a year. And it really wound up, uh, Doug Barber, I'm happy to share his name. He's, he still pastors down in Danville, a great godly veteran. Three of us pastors out at various ages. I'm the golden boy in those days here at Liberty and teaching and speaking publicly to the students. So a lot of very high profile role I had. You know, and that, that those were, and I think you guys really press in. Don't trust your own heart. And it was a crucial season for me. We were back here in the States. It was very disorienting being back here. We'd been 13 years, the last eight years in Asia. It became home to us. And all of a sudden, God plucks us up and puts us on this road to Gaza called Lynchburg. And we wind up here. And I, I, I'm so thankful for those that five-year window of time and i was never able to find that level of transparency with with peers in the ministry the way i did in those days and i'm very thankful that we could share together heart to heart and the stuff of the soul and the burdens that we had and 
I remember, I remember one of the guys one time said, when I get to heaven, this is, I'm not being facetious in any way. I just would like to ask the Lord, why did he decrease my libido mm. <laughs> as I get older mm. when I want to have more vibrant sex mm. and I struggle to have an erection mm. and I just have to laugh mm. <laughs> and I just appreciated, you know, that level of honest transparency, how God's hardwired us is part of the conversation, mm. you know, in this. And I, 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 I want to echo and, and applaud how you guys have just really, and men and women, and as I'm speaking more now still to, to, to mission organizations, and when I'm talking to them to issues about sexual integrity, I will pivot and I will say specifically, and I will say, guys, please remember, this is not now only a male-only issue, but women now are also acknowledging they have a need in this area too, and they're battling with, with lust and immorality and porn. And, you know, I'm actually appreciating their voice in this as well. And I think you guys have really begun to address that specifically for women, too, to honor the fact that uh, we're wanting to help create whole persons in Jesus and healthy. And it's it's just a reality. I, I, I think the accountability piece is huge, Shane. Mm. I want to encourage you to keep pressing in there. Mm. Thanks, Dad. Yeah, I, I think it is, too. And, and trying to reframe accountability is something that is relational and not just a uh, kind of transactional something that is familial um because accountability and we've talked about this before accountability is often seen as kind of like the person who berates you when you fail yeah. you know <laughs> get like your hand slapped the person you go and confess into you know as opposed to confessing need you know or confessing weakness beforehand it's like hey i'm really fragile right now could you be praying for me or could you spend the evening hanging out with me Right. My wife's away, whatever. Um, yeah. So I'm 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 with you on all of that. Um, I do want to start to wind down, but I want to wind down in a particular direction of. Um, with that as your backdrop of sexual revolution, promiscuity kind of growing up um, in your own life, and the life of your friends. Uh, you meet Jesus, go to the Philippines, 13 years, come back, developing a missiology department. You end up getting your doctorate in anthropology and missiology from Western. Uh, and so in the midst of all of that, and then just enjoying the laughter with your family, but then discovering that your son has uh, not just dabbled in pornography, but like, man, this kid is so young, but he's been fully immersed in it. Uh, I... I don't even know if I, I, I remember you guys discovering it when I was pretty young, maybe like 12 or something like that, maybe 11, um, 12, 13, something like that. Uh, and I'd been watching porn for a while um, because I had started watching before I could even physically get off to the stuff. I remember by the time you guys discovered it, I'd kind of learned the mechanics of my body and my heart was pretty hard. I think it was kind of in that eighth grade, maybe post eighth grade year, just for context. Um, eighth grade was a really ugly year for me. There were some deaths and, uh, a girl that <laughs> at least as far as I knew in eighth grade, she was sexually abused and, <clears throat> there was a suicide and it was just a, it was just an ugly year and I stopped uh, liking God. I didn't stop believing he existed. I just stopped liking him. Um, and so I decided to go a different way because I thought, um, yeah, for lack of a better term, I, I, I just didn't like him. I thought God was awful. Um, so uh, I don't, I don't recall exactly when you guys discover the stuff. Um, but uh, take us through that. Hmm. <clears throat> you know, I, I, I look at you today and I do want to say before God, thank you, Lord. Amen. But I will say the eighth grade year and the subsequent year might have been the hardest year that we have had with any of you kids. Yeah. That was just tough. And to see your anger when you went through all those episodes and just didn't know what to do with your emotions. It was, it was a while later that we caught up on the porn <laughs> so I could just see how it was probably had a numbing effect to help you with all of the emotion 
that you were battling with. Uh, and I think at that point, we we uh, we just we were looking around for resources and help. We had a couple of friends come around us to help. Uh, the computer was beginning to become a a prominent theme, and we tried to monitor that. You were just creative enough to circumvent some of the things that we began to put in play. Uh, and I, I, it wasn't until later I began to realize just how creative you are <laughs> in, in the process. But so, so we, we tried to put monitors there. We had friends come in to help us to speak into your life. Mom and I tried to spend more time attuned to you. Mom wisely sat down with me and said, I think there's a season right now where you need to come off the road because a fairly heavy itinerant life, speaking out a lot. Spent a couple of months at home with you. Um, my board at that point in time just willingly let me step back. And and But even then, Shane, it was still hard. I, I, I think we were working with you, but things had to, had to have still been worked out. Uh, in your life and it's going to take much more time but but those were and I want to say if the story ended when you were 14 or 15 or 16 <clears throat> we'd be broken and mm. and it would be devastating mm. but in those days <clears throat> and maybe this might encourage parents we were just filled with uncertainty and I tried to spend much time with you and that was probably the biggest thing from mom's vantage point with me. You need time with your son. So I tried to do as much as I could. Did that intimidate you? Did did needing to spend time with me intimidate you? No. Okay. Wanted to, for sure, because we had it was fun yeah. to be with you. And then we you I had you pick up tennis. Mm. And, you know, I'm I've been a big tennis fan post mm. post college. <laughs> And so we it, it created future patterns so that when we get together and go play now we we get the rackets and we go out and hit. Yeah. Uh, but in those days it, it was I, you know I it, it maybe it's okay maybe we could say this to moms and dads if you don't have all the answers right now, <laughs> but give the time seek the grace of God look for the community, and then by all means look for aids from a movement like yours because for us. The, the answers didn't come quick. Mm. You were such a rascal, son. <laughs> but, you know, you were beautiful. You were you. And we, we, I just kept trying to figure out, God, how do I honor Shane as the individual you've made him to be mm. while I'm trying to steer his heart toward Jesus? And there were moments where I, I just had to let you be you. It was very unnerving. Yeah. Yeah, I think you did a heck of a job, though. I, I look back and I remember how much you guys trusted me, how you would take my word on things, uh, even when I was blatantly lying. Um, and it was very dignifying. I always felt like you guys were in my corner, that you guys always supported me. Um, you guys weren't fools. Like when when I was caught in something, right, there was kind of a, an honest reckoning. But until then, you always gave me the benefit of the doubt, no matter how many times I messed up. So. Truly beautiful and grateful. <laughs> um, Thanks for discipling mom and dad. <laughs> yeah. 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 It does work both ways, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It does work both ways. And it, it took us time. I met Jesus uh, officially uh, <laughs> at the age of 19. And then we spent a, a year together on a farm and did some traveling. We started running together. Um but I would say that's probably when we, I don't even want to say resurrected, but even recreated uh, our relationship together as a kind of a trifecta, me, you, and mom. Because uh, there was a lot of damage there, but then there was new creation. There was Jesus magic. Um, is that, is that, so I met Jesus, moved in with Rick and Katie James, had to learn how to accidentally be their son. Um, and then I could intentionally be your son. Um, so then, you know, stayed in Philly with them, but then a few years later moved to Tennessee with you guys and spent a year with you on a farm, worked there, traveled. Uh, and I would say that's where we re recreated alongside Jesus um, our relationship. Would you say that's true? Yeah, yeah. that's good. And I, 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 um, I think uh, trust was, was rebuilding. 
because trust had, had hemorrhaged over many years, and uh, certainly in my heart, but especially in mom's. And then I, I think we, your, your calling uh, and your orientation paralleled mine, so it made it easier to, I will have to admit. So right. we have these incredible conversations theologically, wrestling together with, with some of the mysteries of our faith. Um, and, and we chat candidly mm. as brothers in the Lord. And then we take time to delight mm. in what each other delights in. Mm. So I probably, in nowadays, which a lot of it's by phone, when I see your name come up on the screen on the phone, it's just a delight. Um, when our moments permit, uh, we just get into these delicious conversations. So it's beautiful to see how God's redeemed it. He's reoriented it in this process at your wedding. Uh, so many of your friends, as you and Kaylee, were bonding together this past May. I, I probably had seven or eight of your peers who had been part of the, the, the bachelor party before and then the wedding and the evening together just come up and say, I look at the relationship that you and Shane have and my heart longs for that. And then the, my encouragement was created mm. by God's grace. You be the next iteration into your world so that there's hope. And I was actually very thankful. You know, Lord, thanks, God, because I can't, I can't see what they see. I can only enjoy the fact that Shane and I just get to hang out. And we love it, uh, love the heck out of it. And... Um, so the friendship now, by God's grace, whatever happened ages 12 to almost 20 over the last 10 years plus, God has redeemed it. Mm. And maybe that's the hope for moms and dads, that there's hope, you know, Shane, and what, mm. what God's done with us. Mm. Well, I love you a lot. Mm. Thanks, for, uh, thanks for being here and having this. I you know some of these waters we've already swam through and explored some of them we haven't sometimes it's just good to readdress because we're not <laughs> static creatures you know uh, answering a question once doesn't mean our perspective of it our view of it doesn't change so thanks for looking at this with me dad i love having you as not just a father but a brother and a friend mm. you are uh, a good friend to me and i'm really grateful for you mm. i love you son it's great to be with you yeah hey and thank you for your voice to the nations Totally. I just love it. Yeah. It's uh, Jesus' kingdom. He invites us to come play. Yeah. I'm grateful for it. So we always end with two questions. One is, um, how can people track with what you're doing? And two, how can we be praying for you? Mm, that's great. Thank you, Shane. Uh, if you want to track with us, uh, nextgenleader.net is one way. Next, all one word, nextgenleader, and then .net. As you know, Mom and I, and we invite you into that space, host this next-gen gig where we try to bring young leaders in from around the world. That's coming, Lord willing, in October here in Virginia. And you do that, what, yearly, every it, other year? It can be yearly. <clears throat> we discern. We have a discernment group mm. <clears throat> that we bring together called Envision, and we try to discern with them what's the Lord saying to us. Mm. Generally, God says yearly, <laughs> but he also says wait a year. Yeah. And I think the... Um, then the second thing in terms of prayer, um, we're really gearing up right now for that October Next Gen conference. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an uncertain world. We normally fly people in from around the world for this. And it's just uncertain given the virus and this environment we find ourselves in. So with that uncertainty, we're still right now, we've gone live recruiting delegates, as we call them. Uh, for the conference. Would you pray into that with us, please? We'd, mm. we'd really appreciate clarity on the 50 to come, the 50 delegates, and and then maybe just the transportation, that the, that the borders are open to bring folks in, and, and we could have a great week together. Mm. You're a gift, Dad. Thanks mm. for being here with us today. I, uh, For context, he was speaking here over the weekend, and uh, <clears throat> we needed a podcast, so we asked him to join us, mm -hmm. and... I'm looking forward to doing this again. Um, even as we're talking, uh, different areas of conversation are springing up in my imagination. And I'm 
looking forward to being able to do this as often as you're down. So yeah, this is good. Thank you for inviting me in. I, as I've said, I, <clears throat> and I, you know, your boss, Nick hmm. Liberto, whom I love dearly. Um, I, I just feel you have created a fresh voice. It's, it's a gentle, thoughtful voice to the people of God. And, and I just appreciate that prophetic orientation that you've given in 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 my days growing up in my awareness of the prophetic voice it was it was probably much more confrontational and praise god i, I know god raises up john the baptist amen sure. but but i just have appreciated uh, as i'm learning you're i'm watching how you're seeing this you're reimagining a message to the body and it's just fun to watch so i just i just love what's going on in the mind mm with you and Nick and your entire team here. Mm. And I just want to encourage everybody when they went over a thousand mm. subscribers on YouTube the other week, I was so excited mm. for Shane. And I want to encourage everyone who's watching, subscribe, mm. track with, become a friend of the movement. Just be mindful that they're an important voice for our day. Mm. And they do it so gently. But I praise God for you. Thanks for letting me have the commercial in there. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. Uh, I love you a lot. Thanks yeah. for being with us. Love you, son. Amen. Folks, I hope that was helpful. Um, our hope really is to normalize these kinds of conversations in the churches you guys find yourselves in, with your friends, your community, your family. Uh, I hope that this has been an example of what that looks like. Uh, as I noted in the beginning, this wasn't scripted. We wanted to have this conversation in front of you all. And uh, it's worth having. It's worth asking questions and just listening and just feeling uh, and just being present uh, to the other person's experiences, whether that be your father or your sister or your brother, whomever, your friend. Um, so thank you for being with us. And uh, go have these kinds of conversations. And uh, yeah, just really thankful for all of you. Please share your thoughts in the comments below. And we will catch you all next time on The Naked Gospel. Hey guys, I want to let you know about an event coming up. But first, Nick, what the heck are you wearing? Well, you see, Shane, I have my eye protection on. I have my ear protection in. And I am ready for the event that you're about to tell the listeners about. Okay. All right. So uh, in a few short weeks on, let's see, August 28th, which is a Saturday, we are doing a fundraiser for Proven Ministries as well as the Naked Gospel. Nick, tell us about the fundraiser. Yeah. Like you said, Saturday, August 28th, it is going to be a blast. Mm -hmm. We are doing our second annual skeet shooting competition fundraiser, shooting guns for a great cause. We are going to have access throwing there's going to be bb guns there's going to be airsoft there's going to be campfires it's going to be amazing and from like two to nine we're going to be hanging out in a field men and women are welcome mm. and really what we're there to do is to raise resources for the naked gospel and for proven ministries because we are about protecting and investing in families in the sexual integrity of young ones and parents alike mm. and so this is a great excuse so for those that are nearby we want you to check it out we are officially inviting you mm. uh, if you would like to register it's very simply va skeet shoot Dot com. And if you can't be here because you're far away, uh, we would uh, be honored for you to participate just by investing with the ministry through the Naked Gospel podcast or just through Proven Ministries. Uh, those gifts will go to advancing the good news of gospel freedom, spreading sexual integrity to those that are in dire need and that need help. And, and from our end, we were just excited to maybe do something a little bit different than the gala or the banquet. Where, you know, we can hang out in a field and shoot guns for a good cause and raise resources to invest in the kingdom. And that's what's going on. I love it. I'm excited for it. Thank you for coming in and sharing that with us, folks. I hope we will catch some of you there. Links will be down below if you're interested and we will catch you next time.